morning. This is Sunday school class. It's June 13th and we are in the book of Genesis. My name is Doug Griffin. We've been going through the book of Genesis uh, since last year. We are, we are now in Genesis chapter 32 and just to catch you up on part one, Genesis 32 part one. Yes. We are just, yes, starting Genesis chapter 32. We finished Genesis 31 basically last week where um, Jacob had, just to recap, Jacob had gotten in a disagreement with his brother. His brother wanted to kill him. So Jacob went to stay with his uncle Laban, which he thought would be just for a few days. That's what his mom said, but it turned out to be 20 years. After 20 years, he's got four wives and 11 children, flocks, and sheep, and goat, and God just blessed him abundantly. Um, ironically, he had wanted Esau's birthright so that he could inherit all this stuff, and God says, you don't need that. I've already got blessings for you, and, and sometimes we get confused like that. Well, the only way God can bless me is if I get that job or if I move to that city or if I, you know, we, we really fixate on that's the way God is going to bless me. And we get really disappointed or frustrated if that particular thing doesn't work out. And yet God has a blessing for us. Who knows? I guess God is smarter than us. So Jacob ends up with a bunch of stuff, uh, so much so that Laban and his sons are very jealous. So Jacob decides... I need to get out of here because they're mad that I've got so much stuff now after working here for 20 years. Um, so he leaves without telling Laban, his uncle, takes the, Laban's two daughters, Rachel and Leah, and their two maids with him and his 11 kids. Well, he has more. He has 11 sons and he has other daughters. But the way the Bible is at that time, they never mentioned that. So um, um, of the Dinah, and there's a reason, specific reason that they mentioned her because she affects the lineage there, um, leading to the Messiah. So he leaves right when Laban is three days journey away. And Laban finds out on the third day and chases after them, shows up and he's really mad. Uh, and they do not come to an agreement. People I've heard sermons where, and then they finally came to Pete. They did not. Uh, Jacob comes up with a good excuse. Okay, I left in the middle of the night because I was afraid you wouldn't let me go. But Laban has another issue. You took my idols. And he says, well, if you find your idols, you can go ahead and kill the person who took them. That's fine with me. But he never finds the idol because Rachel's hiding them. So now Jacob's mad. You chased me all this way and you for no reason. And, and he kind of lets out 20 years worth of, you cheated me 10 times and you've done this. And it's all grievance, right? And I'm so mad at you. And then Laban lets out his grievance. Well, you took my daughters and you took my children. Now, again, the word children can be translated children or grandchildren. It depends on the interpreters when they're looking at the context. In this case, they should have translated it grandchildren. Uh, you took my daughters and you took my grandchildren and you snuck off and he's mad. And all these are really my flocks. And so they don't reach an agreement. So they decide, look, we're at an impasse here. So they were going to have to have some sort of covenant between us because I'm mad enough to kill you, but I'd be in, I'd be killing my daughters and my kids. Uh, so I have to wait till you're alone, basically. Or and you're mad enough to attack me. So let's agree to we're going to stay on each other's sides. You're going to stay on that side. I'm going to stay on this side. Uh -huh. And in Genesis chapter 31, in verse 45. Uh, just this is where we left off. It says, so Jacob took a, so a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brother, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. So they make this, this heap of stones because there was no literal witness. Normally when you make a covenant, there's some sort of witness there between the two sides to say, yes, I was there when they made this agreement. Like your notary public stamps and said, yes, this is legitimate. So they said, these stones are going to be proof. Because look, you know, these stones didn't happen this way by accident clearly men set these stones and set them on top so we this is our proof that something happened here because we can point to that heap of stones 
and say, that's where we made our agreement. So they ate there on the heat because you always eat food when you make an agreement. I like that custom. Uh, and Laban called it Jigar Sahadutha, that's in verse 47, but Jacob called it Galiad, which later became Gilead. Uh, there is a bomb in Gilead. There's a bomb. Man. Yes. There's a bomb? Yep. But it bomb. Okay, so, but uh, in Gilead, so, um, and it means, oh, well, I'll just tell you what, it, I'll just read the Bible. How about that? Verse 48 says, and Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name is called Gilead, that which means heap of witness. Also, like I got a bunch of witnesses. These stones are witness. Also, Mitzvah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me, we absent from one another. Uh, which means may the Lord witness between, be, be the witness or be the guard or the judge between us that we keep this covenant and that you don't come in your side and I don't come in, you don't come in my side and that way we don't kill each other. In, in fact, in verse 50, he goes on to say, if you afflict my daughters or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. So if you start messing up, God will come get you. Uh, then Laban said to Jacob in verse 51, so here is here is this heap and here is this pillar which I place between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and pillar to me. So this is, the, this is you don't come over here and I won't come over there and we're good um, for harm, that you will not come over for harm. So then the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor and the God of their father Terah, judge between us. So, what's his name? The guy we're just, Laban believes in three gods. Uh, at least he believes there's a bunch of gods. So the god of Abraham that he was talking about, and the god of Nahor that my dad that he was talking about, and then the god of their father Terah, whatever. All those gods, because they they believed that they were gods of different regions. That you went to Babylon and they had a god, and you went there and they had a you know. And that's why God's saying, no, I'm God, I'm the God. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. Because, of course, those other gods aren't real. But that's why God would call him God of gods. I'm the God, you know. And, uh, and which is what Jacob swore by. So, uh, and it says, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, which is just another way of saying the God that his father Isaac feared. That's who he swore by. He's not, I'm not swearing by all those other gods just the one that my father was in awe of. Not a fear like awe, not fear like, I'm scared he's gonna, he's gonna hurt me. Uh, 54, then Jacob offered a sacrifice in the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread and they ate bread. They stayed all night on the mountain. Verse 55, and early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. He, it means grandsons and his daughters. So that's who he kissed. Notice he did not kiss Jacob. When he first saw Jacob 20 years ago, and he, he says, and he kissed Jacob, and he said, mm -mm, I'm mad at you. So he kissed his daughters, he kissed his grandsons, he blessed them, and then Laban departed and returned to his place. So I'm so mad I can't even just hug you goodbye. So that, that's where he was at. Now, Genesis 32. So Jacob went on his way, so he left that place, Gilead, and he's heading south. I want to give you a picture uh, like where California and Nevada, there's like a straight line when the people drew it. They drew the straight line in between California and Nevada, and there's several miles that these states are contiguous um, uh, right next to each other. That's a picture of like the Jordan River separating Canaan from the rest of the world, and Jordan River is, is the line. That's why they crossed the Jordan when Moses, what? It was Moses and Joshua fought the, Joshua, I have to sing the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. When Joshua crossed over the Jordan into the promised land, that's when they crossed into Canaan. So like the Jordan is the dividing line. And when Jacob came from Syria up north, he came on the east side of the Jordan, not the Canaan, not the promised land, not the Israel side of the Jordan, the west side of the Jordan. He went on the east side where there is Ammon and Moab and Edom are the countries that are there, the small little areas that are there. Those are Lot's kids, and eventually that's gonna be 
Esau's place where his family is raised in Edom. Edom is where Herod comes from. Um, they're all cousins to Jacob, but they don't like him. So, but He went on his way and the angels of God met him on the east side. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he looks and he goes to a particular place and sees armies of God's uh, angels there. Um, now, God will do this every so often. And it's not good news, usually, when God does some big miracle to show you that he's present it's because you're about to face some very stressful situation and he needs to let you know I'm present. So whatever, if what's, if, you know, we're excited, oh, God came to a dream and well, that means some stressful things about to happen, not a defeating thing, not a thing that we're going to lose, but that's going to put you a lot of stress and you needed that sign from God, that word from God to see you through it so that you had something to hold on to as you went through this stressful situation. So he's excited, of course, to see all these angels, but that means he's about to go through something stressful. So he says, ooh, this is God's camp, because it's like an army of angels. Um, and in Psalm 34, 7, it says the angel of the Lord camps around all those who fear him and delivers them. So he's just giving him a glimpse. He's giving Jacob a glimpse of the angels that are there around all of us. Um, so, and, and we have God's word for that. And that's when we trust in his word and, and believe his word, that we walk in situations that his angels are, are there to help us and to protect us. We don't uh, need to see them to know that they're there because faith is the substance of things not seen. And God appreciates when we're not doubting Thomas and says, well, no, I got to see the nail prints in his hand. I know the man appeared in the room suddenly, but that could have been anybody appearing in the room looking like Jesus. I need to see the nail prints. I mean, and that's, you know, that's why Jesus says, blessed are those who, who have not seen and yet believe. So we don't have to see it all for us to believe that it's there. We have God's word for it. Um, in 2 Kings, we've gone over this probably four times in the last month or so. I brought up this particular scripture. But in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the armors were of Syria, that's where Laban lives, were surrounding Israel. They'd come down. Um, Elisha is there with his servant, and in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, it says, so he answered and said, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant's thinking, what are you talking about? There's only two of us. I know who's with us. It's you. And I'm with you, and you're with me, and that's it. And he says, no, 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 no. They're, those who are with us are more than what you see, these, these armies that are surrounding us. And in verse 17, it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So God's angels were there, and, and Elisha just prayed so that this guy could calm down. Let him see who's here. So if we if, if we ever glimpsed into the spiritual realm, which is all around us, we want to think that heaven is way, 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 way. But but God's spiritual realm is right here with us, among us. We just cannot see it. It's like we're colorblind. You, you know, somebody who's colorblind, the color blue is there, but they can't see it. Their eyes also doesn't register it. It just looks gray to them. It's like uh, if you could give them special glasses and they go, oh, man, look at all this color. If God could give us special glasses, we go, oh, look, all these, these angels are around us, and we'd be less afraid, right? So that's why I said, here, God opened his eyes. Now, here's one scripture that's always used about angels that actually doesn't apply to us. The other scriptures that I read do. This one actually doesn't apply to us, uh, uh, but, but we, we, we try to apply to us, and that's okay. But, it, you know, uh, in Psalm 91, 11, it says, for he shall give his angels charge over you, specifically you, to keep you in all your ways. And their, and in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Yeah. That's also, that's specifically talking about the Messiah. That's a prophecy to the Messiah. And, and he will guard you. If you read the whole thing, it's talking about a specific person. When he comes, this is what will happen. And he will actually lift you up and you won't dash your foot against the, a, a stone. Um that scripture is not about us specifically, but the other ones are, like he sends his angels for those who will fear him. The, the devil used that scripture on Jesus because the devil knew who it was for. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 7, it says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city 
and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. So they were out in the wilderness and then the devil brought Jesus to Jerusalem and they're on the, this temple and they're at the very top of the temple. Nobody sees them up there. Nobody, because you can't see the roof of the temple. Uh, and, and so people are down in the bot, you know, doing their prayers and doing what they're supposed to do. And 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 the devil and Jesus are on top of the, the temple. And he says, and he said to him, the devil says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, specifically you, and in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So, you know, you could just throw yourself down because the scripture already says he's got it. His angels are going to catch you and prevent you from falling. So you won't dash your foot against these stones. So dive because that proved to everybody you're the son of God. Now, for most of us, that would not be a temptation. Throw yourself off the top of the Empire State Building. I'm not really tempted to do Surprisingly, that's not working on me. I'm just not. I'm not good. Yeah, I won't even go there. So I'm good with that. So why say why was that a temptation? Because in this case, it was at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. Jesus's Jesus ministry, and uh, he could save himself three and a half years of fighting and arguing if he could just suddenly float down in front of everybody. If, if the angels caught him up, and because they're all there, all the Pharisees are there, the scribes, the Sadducees, they're all there. He comes down and says, "Hi, I'm the Messiah." Well, they'd have to believe it because that's what they think he's supposed to do is split the heavens open and come down like that. And he's going to, but that's at the end of time. And so, but that's what they're looking for because they were misreading the scriptures. So Jesus just suddenly floated down, which the angel, with, with uh, Lucifer said, the angels have to do this scripture because you can throw yourself off the building and, God, and they have to catch you because you can't dash your foot against the stone. You can't, all this stuff that cannot happen to you, God has to fulfill. Now, if we're crazy and throw ourselves off a building, God's not obligated to to do to well. Got to catch you because because surprisingly that has not worked. Uh, so we can't just take every scripture and say, "Oh, that's for me. I can do that. I'm going to go part the Red Sea right now." Uh, there are specific things for specific people, but He does send His angels over all of us, right, to to guide us and to to protect us. But we can't be act foolishly. In fact, Jesus said to the devil. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. I can't act foolishly. I, I, I can only do the things that God has told me to do. And, and in those cases, he will protect me for sure. I don't have to worry about it. Sometimes when I'm disobedient, God's mercy still flows and he protects me anyway. But I don't have to wor uh, count on his mercy if I'm just walking in obedience to his word because he's going to protect me. So whenever he sends me somewhere, he's going to send his angels there to guard me and protect me. That's what was going on with Jacob. Jacob had, he would said to Jacob, you, it's time for you to leave Laban and I'm going to protect you. So he opened his eyes and says, look, all these angels are around you. Uh, G, so here's where that was fulfilled for Jesus, though, because there was a situation. Well, there was a situation. So in Luke chapter four, verse 28 through 30, right after Jesus left Satan here, uh, and went to the temple and he opened up the books and he read to them in Isaiah where it says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me and he says today that scripture is fulfilled in your ears and they were like huh? you're saying that you're the Messiah yes and he says I know you will say physician heal thyself like show us some miracle to prove yourself he says but the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah and and he says oh what well, I'm sorry that's not what he says there he says there were a lot of um, lepers back in the old days, but he was only sent, remember the, the, the prophet was only sent to that one leper and the rest because, and in the Jewish culture, they believe that's because all the rest of the lepers were unbelievers and only one believed. It says there was only one widow who he was sent to, to bless her. And the Jews believe, well, that's because all the, because why would God single out that one person? Well, the rest must be all sinners. So Jesus is saying, I'm not gonna do a miracle here basically because you're all sinners. The, the people who have seen my miracles, those are the people God has sent me to. And so clearly, if he's not doing a miracle in front of you, you're like those other lepers who weren't healed. And they're enraged. Like, you're saying that we're sinners? How dare you? You just got here. And he really had just gotten there. He's already telling them, you're all sinners. Because they were. And Jesus couldn't hold it. He couldn't hold his peas. So, uh, so now they're very upset. So in verse 28, Luke 4, 28. 
It says, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things were filled with wrath and they rose up and they thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built because the city is built on a mountain. So they're, they're leading him to the mountain. It says that they might throw him down over the cliff. So they take him and they take, they're holding him right over the edge and they're trying to throw him over the cliff. And yet for some reason, the next verse says, but passing through the midst of them, he just went on his way. Ah. So they took him and they thought they had thrown him over the midst, over the hill, but the angels fulfilled that scripture that the devil had just been talking to him about. And they caught him and they let he dashed his foot against the stone. They bore him up so that he didn't dash his foot against the stones. And then they and he was able just to pass through their midst and just is that man floating? And that they will let us come back another day because that I'm not, I'm not, mm, what kind of devil is bull? No. So, uh, so Jesus didn't do something to tempt God. I think I'll just go to this cliff and throw myself off. He was in a situation where they tried to throw him off the cliff, but the angels bore him up and, and he didn't dash his foot against the stone. So we don't tempt God. We don't put ourselves in situations on purpose to make to see if God's going to, if his word's going to be true. The, <laughs> the, the devil said, you should just go ahead and try God and see if he really will stop that bleeding. So we don't do something crazy like that. But if we find ourselves in a situation, he wants us to know his angels are there to protect us. So that's why he opened uh, the eyes of Jacob. In fact, it says uh, in, in Hebrews ch chapter one, when it's talking about angels, it says, aren't they not all ministering spirits? This is Hebrews 1, 14. Sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So they're, they're sent forth to minister for us, to serve us. We don't tell them what to do. Uh, God has already given them the assignment for us. So Jacob didn't go, when he saw this bunch of angels, he said, okay, three of you, I want you right here on my shoulder, and you four go down to McDonald's and get me a burger. He didn't start commanding the angels and telling them what to do. And some people will tell you, you got to put your angels to work. you got to tell them what to do. But it didn't say that anywhere in the Bible. No one ever did that. No one ever told the angels. If they asked, if they asked the angel, what's your name? The angel said, don't mind asking about my name. There's only one name you we'll need to worry about, and that's the name of the Lord, Jehovah. So, so people have gotten fascinated about angels. They've written books about angels. They're there. We don't have to engage them. They've, he's already sent them to minister for us. He's already sent. God has sent them. They're his angels, and he has sent them to minister to us, right? Um, in Joshua chapter 5, here's just an interesting uh situation Joshua chapter 5 verse 13 through 14 they've just crossed over to the promised land right he's led them they crossed over the Jordan Jacob is on the east side of the Jordan Joshua's taking them to the west side of the Jordan where Canaan is they've just gotten there he's given their assignments and says okay we're gonna have to fight all these enemies of God and in Joshua 5 13 it says and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho and that was the first city they were going to attack or he was being led, he thought they were going to attack. Actually, God attacked the city in Jericho. They didn't have to do anything but march around it, right? And there's a lot of problems. If we'll just march around it, God will fight our battle. We're too busy fighting the battle, and God's already said, just, just march around the problem. It's okay. I'll take care of it. So, But Joshua doesn't know what's going to happen. He just knows we're at Jericho, because God tends to just give you one lesson at a time. So they're at Jericho. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He says, then he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for your adversaries? Like our adversaries, you got to pick a side. Are you on our side or are you on their side? So he said, no, meaning I'm not on either person's side, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So I'm not on your side. I'm not on their side. I'm on God's side. And you need to be in God's side. And whenever you're on God's side, then I'm on your side. But whenever you're doing your own thing, then good luck to that. So he says, no, because you tell him to pick Zion. I'm not, I'm not, the answer is no, I'm not on either of those sides. I'm commander of the army of the Lord, and I have come. And Joshua fell down on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, well, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then you give me instruction. So notice he didn't say, oh, you're my angel? Well, let me put you to work. He says, what does my Lord say? Like, tell me what God wants me to do. We're his servants. He's not our servants. Hey, God, I want you to go down and do this. 
Okay, so he opened Jacob's eyes, just to go back. He opens Jacob's eyes and lets him see because he's about to come into the situation. God will give you sometimes adv advance warning about something. And again, if a miracle happens, if something fantastic happens, it's for you to hold on to. He's not going to speak again. And it's not because he's on vacation. It's because he wants us to believe that the thing he told us last week, last month, last year, whenever it was, is still true, that he's still God. He hasn't gone anywhere. And, and um, when I was on the San Diego freeway driving to a friend's house that I had never been to before, the, the, um, the GPS spoke and said, you know, 20 miles to the next ep ep exit or something, and didn't say another word. And I'm driving five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I'm getting nervous because I'm not hearing anything else. And I remember pulling up to the side of the road like, oh my God, did I miss it? And did I, why didn't they speak again? Because I hadn't gotten to the off ramp yet. And then when I finally got to this off ramp, then it said, here you are, yeah, make a right turn on this exit. And, and, but I got nervous because I hadn't heard anything. I didn't trust <laughs> that what the GPS, that the GPS would say something else. I thought, oh, it's dead now. And, and that's what we think about God. When we get in a situation, why hasn't God spoken? Because he already spoke. A lot of times he already spoke. He, he did some wonderful thing to let you know that he's there. And now that you're in the situation, he wants you to believe and relax and trust. So, okay, Jacob, I'm showing you this big army. That's because a stressful thing is about to happen. And I need you to just trust that I'm with you. So in Genesis 32, verse 2, second part of verse 2, he says, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim, uh, which means two camps, two camps. Now, this place, Mahanaim, that he names became famous because they knew that there's a bunch of angels there. Now, here's what's interesting. There are a bunch of angels everywhere. But in their minds, and we do this same thing, that's where God is. So whenever somebody was in big trouble, they go to Mahanaim, which means two camps of angels. And I guess they were divided into camps. Um, they, and so, so they go there because they think, well, that's where God is. And, and we've got to believe that God is wherever we are. Uh, because sometimes we, oh man, we got to go, we got to get to the church because that's where God is. Or we got to get to that place where that miracle happened because that's where God is. We, uh, remember in the, in the New Testament when the man was sitting by the side of uh, the pool of Siloam and, and whoever got there first, that's where the angel was going to trouble the water and that person would get healed. And Jesus is standing next to him and what can I do for you? Oh, well, I've got no man to take me down to the water and I would, well, do you want to be healed? Well, no, I can't. Yeah, but I got to get there. And Jesus is like, I'm here. You don't need to get there. I'm right here next to you. And and that's how God wants us to think. I'm right here next to you. So you don't have to get to a certain place for, okay, now that we're here at the mountain, now I can hear from God. Because God will speak to you in the in the CVS pharmacy. He'll, he'll protect you in your car, you know. And so he wants us to believe that. But they thought, Mahanaim is the place where the angels are. And so they would go there whenever they were in trouble, not knowing God was with them. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, um, Saul and David are in a war. Now, David's trying not to be in the war. David doesn't want to fight Saul. David's like, Saul, you're king, and I don't know why you're so mad at me. Well, he's mad because God had already told Saul, I'm replacing you. They didn't know that. Like, well, I don't know why you're fighting me, but I'm not fighting you. And, and But Saul's intent, I'm going to fight David. Well, he's going to lose that fight, which is what he did. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 7, Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened, be valiant, for your master Saul is dead. Saul had gotten killed in battle. And David's explaining to somebody, you know, even though this has happened, be strengthened, God has more for us. And also of the house of Judah, he has anointed me king over them. So this is David saying, I've been anointed the new king over the house of Judah. But Abner, in verse 8, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Isbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, those Asher, his family lived there, Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, and over all Israel. So let me take 
even though Saul just lost in a terrible battle, let me take his son to Mahanaim because that's where he'll be protected. And I'll declare that he's king because I don't want David to be king because we think we can stop what God is doing. And and so they, he took him there. Well, so that didn't last. Clearly, it didn't work because David ended up being king. But I'm going to go to that place because that's where all those angels were. That's where Jacob saw those angels. In 2 Samuel 17, another time of Mahanaim was, was used. Okay, so Absalom, David's son, is fighting David. Because David just had a, a hard time of it, uh, especially with his family, because David did a lot of stuff and there were consequences, right? So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is fantastic. All right, um, so Absalom is looking for advice. David is about to uh, cross over the Jordan. Uh, he's at the Jordan and he's, a, he's about to cross over and go to Mahanaim, right? Because at, his son is wanting to fight and David's not wanting to fight his son. Um, so they're trying to figure out what to do. Because if, if David can get away and he gets enough people to follow him, those people are going to come in and attack Absalom. So Hushai, I mean, I'm sorry. So Ahithophel, Ahithophel gave them great advice. He said, let's go now. Let's attack him now before he crosses the Jordan and goes over to Mahanaim. Let's attack him now while he's still weak. He's exhausted. We should attack him now. Well, they said, that's pretty good. But just in case, let me ask this guy to see what he said. And the guy said, no, let him rest for the night. Let him, we don't need, we, let's get a bunch of people first. And it doesn't matter if he gets away and goes across the other side. We'll get a bunch of people and then we'll attack him. That's what's more important is the, is the number of people that we have. So in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4, so it says, So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, You know, the advice of Hushai, the archite, is better than the advice of Ahithophel. For the Lord had purpose to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Ab Absalom. So he, God knew that Ahithophel had gave good advice, but God put it in their heart to say, You know what? That man over there, that's what he said is even better than what this man has said, because he says God wanted to defeat that good advice. So, so they all went, I should listen to him. You know, I was going along a great path, but then somebody says something that made all the sense in the world. You know, what I really should do is eat only berries for the rest of my life. You know, and so they gave him, and people will go along with crazy advice, which is what they did. Absalom went along with. Even though he'd been given the right counsel, David would have been defeated. They'd listen and they gathered army, which gave David a chance to escape. So uh, in verse 30, in verse 22 of 2 Samuel chapter 17, it says, So David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. And by morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. So they crossed over. And now... And then they crossed over. See, and now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey, he arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and he hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. So Ahithophel had given the correct advice. Get David now before he crosses the Jordan while he's still weak and exhausted. But they didn't follow that advice. And when David got away and he saw that they were trying to build up armies, he knew that David was going to go to Mahanaim and that he was going to gather people there and, and that Absalom was going to lose. And he also knew that when David came back and defeated Absalom, that they would try to find who were the traitors and that his name would be the first one mentioned and they were going to kill him. So he said, OK, I'm about to die. So I'd rather just kill myself than wait for David to win this battle and then kill me. Because you didn't listen to me, and so you're about to lose Absalom. So he went home and he hanged himself, bless his heart. It says, then David, verse 24, went to Mahanaim. And Absalom crossed over the Jordan, and he and all the men of Israel with him. So they, then they crossed over, but it was too late. David was already in Mahanaim, this safe place where they knew all these angels of God were. And David had a chance to recoup and gather his troops. So Mahanaim became this place that you went to to be safe. In their minds, we know that the angels of God are there because Jacob saw them. The good news for us is the angels are everywhere. If God were to open our eyes, you just see angels sitting around there on your couch. They're sitting on your top of the sink. 
they're just everywhere, you know, they're everywhere. So, so we wouldn't have to live in so much fear. Verse three of, of Genesis chapter 32, then Jacob sends messengers before him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So Esau is on the east side and he's down in Edom. He does not live in Edom yet. And Seir and Edom, which is named after, which eventually became called Seir and Edom. They weren't called that at that time. Uh, but those were nicknames for, for Esau. And he eventually conquered that place. So he's actually on a scouting expedition. And apparently Jacob had gotten word. You know, these, when it says the angels of the Lord, those are the messengers of the Lord. So apparently they told him, Esau, where to find Esau? So Esau's on a scouting expedition. He is going to later conquer this whole area. Uh, but Jacob doesn't know why Esau is there. He just knows that Esau is there. So Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. That's where Esau eventually lives. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says. Now he calls, make sure you call Esau my Lord, and that you say, I'm his servant, because he's trying to reverse what had happened earlier, because when he got the blessing, and that's really the bigger thing that Jacob, that Esau was upset about, Jacob got his blessing. When, his, when their dad, Isaac, prayed for Jacob, thinking it was Esau, he prayed this incredible blessing, and your brother's sons, your brother's family will serve you and you'll be reign over him. And he prayed all this thing. He was praying it over Esau. He was trying to force God. I will pray a blessing over Esau. That's going to force God to make him the preeminent one. But he's praying over Jacob because you can't fool God. You can't like, oh, I messed God up. Did you? So, so that's what Esau was really upset about is that he, you're making you just made Jacob my lord and made him made me his servant. And I'm the older one and I'm so upset. So he says, when you send this message to Esau, say it this way. Speak thus to my lord Esau. Make sure you know that he's my lord and say, thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban. I've stayed there until now because he they didn't tell him Esau where, where Jacob was. And so uh, he said, I don't know. He just left. I don't know where he went. He says, I've been with Laban. I've stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. So he's trying to say, I already have a bunch of stuff. I don't need your birthright. I'm not after your birthright. Look, I've got all this stuff. So I'm not after your birthright. And he's trying to calm him down. Because in, in the, in the here's, so here's what Esau, here's what Isaac prayed over Jacob in Genesis 27, verse 29. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brother and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse be everyone who curses you and bless be those who bless you. So he's praying that over Jacob, thinking he's praying that over Esau. And when Esau said, wait, you prayed the wrong prayer. Pray for me. He said, okay. So here's what he prayed for him. By your sword, you shall live, which was true. And you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So you're going to serve him. But when you become restless, you'll break his. Now that happened actually hundreds of years later. He was actually talking about generations later. They served the, the Edomites, served uh, the Israelites, I mean, Jacob's kids, right? Because Jacob later turned his name to Israel. But at a certain point, they rebelled. Uh, actually, when David was no longer king and Solomon was no longer king, then, then the Edomites rebelled. But Jacob knew what this prophecy was because they told him, people, the servants who heard it said, ooh, he's going to break your neck. <laughs> and, you know, so this is part of why he's scared. And, and it says in verse 41 of that, of 27, so Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning of my father at hand, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. So in both prayers, he both prayers were, you end up serving your brother. You end up serving your brother. And this made him crazy. I got, I'm going to kill him, and then I won't serve nobody. Uh, because again, he thinks, I can thwart God. I'll just kill Jacob, and then that'll take care of that. I won't have to worry about serving him. Uh, so, because they didn't understand that God was God of all things that happen. You can't 
thwart him. You can't go around him. He's God of everything that happens. And if he's decreed it, it's because he's seen it. He's already seen what's going to happen. And he's telling you, here's, here's what's going to happen because I saw it. So you can't make anything else happen. Um, verse. So back to chapter 32 of Genesis. So then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also was coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he did. So obviously, right? Because he sent this, I'm your servant. You're my Lord. Even though our dads prayed the opposite, I'm actually your servant. And I've got so many oxen. And so I don't need your money. And I don't need your birthright. And I don't need your blessing. And they came back and said, and Esau could have said, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, brother. But he didn't say anything. He just says, well, I'm coming to meet him with my 400 men. So he's panicked, even though God just showed him, you know, you have a company of angels, two companies of angels around you, two camps of angels around you. He's still stressed out. And that's how we get. God pays our bill in March and in April, we stress out all over again. It's like, doesn't matter what God does. We panic the next time we get in a stressful situation. And God's like, didn't I just, didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? And, and why not deliver every man? And, and, and the slaves would sing those songs like that because he's trying to remind us, if God delivered Daniel from lions, then he'll deliver you. If God did this, and that's why we have to put ourselves in remembrance of God's word and remembrance of what he's done. And, and, and if we spent more time being thankful and, and having prayers of thanksgiving, thank you, God, for this and this and this, we'd be less stressed later because we'd be reminding ourselves daily of all the things that God has already done for us. So Jacob saw the two camps of angels around him, and now he's freaking out because Esau's on his way with 400 men. Saw 60,000 angels around him because that's what they say a camp of angels is in, in Jewish literature. So he saw 60,000 angels. Um, actually, they say he saw 120,000. He divided them into two camps of 60,000. But either way, he saw a whole bunch of angels. So 400 men were not going to defeat all those angels. But he forgot that that quickly. He stressed out. So he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps. So maybe he said, I'll, I'll do what those angels did. I'll divide into two camps, except he's not doing it as an offensive thing. He's doing a defensive measure because he said, and if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. So uh, he's totally in retreat mode, right? Okay, I'll divide it in half. And that must be what that sign was. I saw two camps of angels. So I'll divide my company into two camps. That's what God's showing me. So that when Esau shows up, he'll only kill half the people and the other half of us can get away. Oh, thank you, God. Now I, I totally understand what that message meant. So then Jacob said, and he's praying, oh, God of my father, Abraham and God of father, Isaac and the Lord who said to me, now he's putting him in remembrance of his word, return to your country and to your family and I will do, deal well with you. Says, I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I've become two companies. I have so many people that I've. So he's saying, I crossed over this Jordan to head towards Syria, to head toward Laban. All I have is my staff. And now I have so much stuff that I'm able to divide it into two companies. So now I am two companies. He says, I don't even deserve that. So in verse 11, he says, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. I mean, he's going to attack all of us and kill. He don't know my wife. He's going to attack my kids. He's going to attack all of us. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he's, he's, he's right. He's putting God in remembrance of his word. But he doesn't then relax. Okay, I've prayed. I've asked for God's deliverance. I put, I've reminded God that he said he would deliver me. And so now I'm going to go to the beach. That could have, but instead he still is in panic mode. So he's like, God, I please deliver me. But he's not sure he's going to. Verse 13. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. It's like, I know. And so his mind is still figuring things out. And we do this. After we pray, we still keep figuring stuff out. Okay, I'll know what I'll do. I'll do this, then I'll do that. Because we, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. I'm going to make Esau forgive me because he's clearly still upset. Now, he doesn't have any clue in 20 years if his brother has forgiven him or not. So he's assuming he has not. 
and and uh, and that's what that sign from those angels meant. And so let me start sending him presents, and that will calm him down. So he he started sending stuff to Esau, who's on his way there. He's not even sure when he's going to get there. In verse fourteen, it says he sent him two hundred female goats and twenty male goats. Now that there was just the mathematical thing that they, if you only need twenty males and, and you send two hundred females, uh, that's and so you 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 send them out in a certain way because if there's too many males and there's not enough females, then the male goats start attacking each other. So he says two hundred female goats and twenty male goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams. It's the same sort of mathematical. Thing. Ratio. Ratio. Thank you. 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. So, you know, there's a way that he's dividing this up. But he keeps sending him at different intervals, right? Okay, he's coming. So I want every two miles, I need another gift and another gift and another gift, you know, and this is going to calm him down because a, a gift soothes the savage beast, you know. Then he delivered them into the hand of his servants. Every drove by itself, every uh, group by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves, right? Because I want him to not get this all at once. He won't appreciate it all at once. He'll just, I want to wow him by just with another gift and another gift. And he commanded the first say, one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Who and who are those in front of you? Like who, you know, who's all that stuff? Then you shall say, they are your servant, Jacob's. And make sure you say that he's your servant. And is a present sent to my Lord, Esau. And behold, he's also behind us. So these are all from your servant, Jacob. And he said, send them to my Lord, Esau. And he's behind us. He's not, he's not running away. He's right behind us. But And then you give it to him and then you just kind of walk with him toward me. And then the next about an hour later, he's going to get another gift. And about an hour later, he'll get another gift. And I just want this to just keep coming all night. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the droves, saying, in, in this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterward, I will see his face. And then perhaps he will accept me. So he's assuming the worst and assuming this method will appease him. Now, I'm bringing this up because Jacob is still, still not relaxing in God. He's still not, he still cannot trust that God's going to handle it. He's still thinking, I got to do something. I got to manipulate it in some way. I know what God wants me to do, and I still got to get in there, and oh, and I got to wrestle with this thing and make it happen. He's still wrestling with God. He is still wrestling trying to take control of the situation in some way, it's hard for us to give up total control. It's hard for us to say, you know what, God, you're going to have to handle this whole thing. I'm exhausted. So God will exhaust us, which is what's about to happen next week when Jacob wrestles with the angel. God will just wear you out so that you can't do anything else. So that you say, I give up. And God's like, yay, good. Now would you let me handle it? Because you don't know how to handle it. I've already got this handled, as a matter of fact, but you're wrestling with me when you try to take control. And that's what will be our lesson next week, wrestling with God. So this week is two camps. Thank you so much for, for listening in. Uh, um, I will be back on Wednesday. We're still in the book of Matthew. And um, and for you good chapter members, just remind me that we do have service. It starts at 1045 at that church. Okay, again, thank you. You guys are I, it's so amazing that you listen in each week. Uh, and God bless you, and I will talk to you later.